Good morning. Welcome to Palm Sunday at Greenfield Hill Congregational Church. Uh, please join me now in our responsive call to worship for Palm Sunday, and we invite you to wave your palms high as we say Hosanna. This is the day the Lord has made. Let, Let us, us rejoice, rejoice and, and be glad, glad in it. Open wide the gates of your hearts. Let the, the Savior, Savior enter. enter. Shout with joy all the people. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Hosanna. Please join me in our hymn, All Glory, Laud, and Honor, number 192. Before we sit back down, let's uh, greet one another with the peace of Christ. What a special treat we have this morning. Something that uh, we love to do in this church is to honor the gifts of our young people, the, the many and varied gifts that they bring to us. And today, we are so happy to welcome into worship the gift of dance as shared with us by our own Catalina Zapata. Catalina is a freshman at Staples High School and blessed us with the gift of dance at our Thanksgiving worship. And we're so glad to have her at our Palm Sunday. So Catalina, come on out and direct your attention right up here.
There's a beautiful psalm that says we are meant to express our praise to God in every way that we can. And the gift of dance is one of the ways that we express that praise. And we are so grateful to Catalina for starting our Palm Sunday with such beauty. So welcome, welcome to Palm Sunday worship. We are so glad to have you here. And if you're worshiping with us for the first time, we are especially glad that you wandered through these doors and hope that you'll grab one of our visitor bags on the way out at the front door. Somewhere around you is that green sign-in pad that we'd invite you to share around your pews so that we can welcome our visitors and also a good place to jot down anything we ought to know. Right after worship today, something very special brought to us by our Mission and Outreach Board, a volunteer fair, and I'm going to ask Karen Fox to come forward and tell us what to expect over in the memorial room. Here you are. Good morning. Um, on behalf of the Mission Board, I invite you all, please, to come join us in the memorial room. This is, as far as I know, as of recent years, our first ever volunteer fair. That's at least what we're calling it. Um, our intention this year was to provide uh, members of the church an opportunity to engage with and understand what volunteer opportunities there may be with the organizations locally that we, as a church, through the mission board, um, financially support. Uh, some of you, are deeply entrenched with the, some of the Oates organizations. Many of you have been the ones that have brought them to a leader, David's attention. Um, but for some, it's just this thing from afar that the mission board gives some money out and um, you may see the names listed at Dogwood or somewhere else, but they're a little bit too far away from you to really touch and connect with. So we're hoping that um, we can engage you with refreshments and a fellowship over there. There is no requirement that you sign up to volunteer, but it's an opportunity to bring them a little closer to you. Um, when we checked in with our local organizations, and that's from our pillars like Pivot House or Siri, which we're more connected to, to newer organizations like Laundry Love, all of them jumped at it. And they have um, some excited representatives over there. Um, to, in, to talk to you, and also some of them have um, volunteer sign-up sheets as well. So hope to see you over there. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. 
and Karen, along with Karen Kirchner, is uh, co-chair of our Mission and Outreach Board. Well, just a, a, a few announcements. Well, actually, a whole lot. This is a pretty important week in the life of the church. This is the first day of Holy Week, and between now and the joy of Easter, we will be gathering for worship several times and remembering the events of this sacred week together. So we invite you to make room in your schedule to be a part of all that goes on this week, or at least some of it. Dip your toe into all that we're offering between now and next Sunday, because it is a rich and deeply spiritual week, and we'd love to have you in it. On Thursday evening, we'll gather here for a special communion service remembering Jesus' Last Supper. We actually have one long table down the middle of the church, and we'll close our service by gathering around it for communion. Very special, um, certainly something we'd love to have all ages at, and we invite people to bring a favorite cup from home to receive communion in. Then on Friday at noon, starting right here, we have a service that we uh, call Stations Toward the Cross, and you may be familiar with Stations of the Cross, this is our own version of it. We tell the stories of Jesus' life as we walk from here over to our beautiful memorial garden. And uh, again, all ages very welcome. That night, Good Friday night at 7.30, is perhaps our most solemn and serious uh, service of the year, the beautiful tenebrae service as the lights dim and we remember Jesus' last hours. And that is a, a very special service, a, a very holy, sacred, and, and solemn moment. And then it's on to Easter joy, Easter uh, Saturday morning, I should say, at 10 o'clock. We have our Easter egg hunt put together by our junior deacons for our kids, and we'd love to have you. We meet in the memorial room at 10 and then head out onto the church grounds. That evening at 5 o'clock, we have our Easter Eve service, a tradition we started probably seven years ago now, a way of bringing the Easter joy a little earlier, especially if you might be traveling on Easter. Come and celebrate with us Easter Eve at 5, you'll have our Easter messages from David and me and, uh, and our Easter hymns, of course. And then on Sunday morning at 7 o'clock, our confirmands lead the early service here. They are working hard on their Easter messages already. And then at 9 and 11, not 9 and 10, 30, 9 and 11, full-on Easter joy with our chancel choir uh, who have been practicing for weeks. That will be incredibly special. And then... After Easter, I want to make sure that you pay attention to what's on the inside back cover of your bulletin, which is the first progressive dinner that we've had in many years since pre-COVID. This is a really wonderful fellowship event in the life of this church, and we welcome as many of you as want to come. The more, the merrier. We gather at actually my house for appetizers at the Parsonage and then head out to church member homes to share dinner in small groups and then gather back together. It's just a great evening, and uh, we hope you can make it and let us know if you can. So that is all, or just a glimpse, I should say, of all that's going on in the life of our church, and we invite you to take your bulletin home so that you can keep track of what's happening. I'm going to invite the choir forward to, uh, to continue the joy of Palm Sunday.
So I'm going to invite all the kids that are here to come up here with me, holding your palms. Bring a palm with you. If you don't have one already, the nice people at the back of the church will give you one, or two, or ten. They've got lots. Come on up here. All right, so first I need to check on your awakeness because you're going to need to be awake for this next part. Are you guys awake? Are you awake? Yes. Are you really awake? Yes. Okay, okay, I feel, I think we're ready. I think we're ready. So you might have heard me say earlier that in the Bible it says there's lots of ways to express our praise to God. And this morning, you saw my friend Catalina over there. She was dancing. That's one way to say, yay, God. And then you heard my friends in the choir. They were singing. And that's another way to say, yay, God. And a long time ago, when Jesus came to town, to the big city of Jerusalem, people had other ways of saying, yay, God, yay, Jesus. First of all, they did something that I think you're going to be really good at. They shouted. I think we're going to be good at this. They shouted a word. Hmm, anyone know what word they shouted on Palm Sunday? Shout it out. Hosanna, Hosanna. That means yay, basically, and God is here, and I'm so happy. So we're going to practice shouting Hosanna. Are you ready? Okay. Oh, we're going to be kind of loud. Is that okay? Okay. You want to come stand next to me? I think you'll be okay. Okay, here we go. On the count of three, we're going to shout Hosanna. One, two, three. Hosanna! That was pretty good. The other thing they did is what you're already doing. They went and got leaves off the tree and they waved them because back then they didn't have pom-poms and noisemakers, a bunch of other stuff. They just gathered leaves and they waved them and they shouted Hosanna. So we're gonna do another one on the count of three. We're gonna shout Hosanna and wave our palms all at the same time. Are you ready? One, two, three. Hosanna! All right, you got this. You are ready for our procession. We are going to go from here to there. Think we can do it? I feel like we can do that. We're gonna go from here to there, but here's the thing. We're gonna be shouting Hosanna and waving our palms as we go on our palm processional over to church school. All right, everybody ready? Here we go. Oh, we get music too. Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna! 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 As we come now into our time of prayer, um, let me 
me share with you the, the concerns of our church family, and then I'll ask if there's anyone that you'd like us to remember. Ask your continued prayers with the, the Corbett family as we prepare for the funeral this week on Thursday of Peter Corbett, uh, beloved to all of us. So please continue to hold Jen and all her family in your prayers. Uh, yesterday we gathered here for the funeral of uh, Margot Voida, who was uh, a part of our church family some years ago before moving to Florida. So I'd ask your prayers with the Voida family. And then I've received several requests, uh, not, not with names attached, but uh, for us to remember those who are going through treatment right now and, um, and journeying with cancer. Are there others that we should be holding in our hearts this morning? Then let's come together in prayer. Christ, our loving Lord, on this day we remember we remember the joy of an entire city pouring out onto the streets to greet you with exuberance, a people longing for new hope who knew that in you they had found it, a people longing for healing, knowing they were in the presence of mercy. Christ, our loving Lord, help us to open our hearts to you with that same joy. Help us to believe, to truly believe, that in you is hope and healing, that you are the companion we yearn for, the friend who never leaves, the one whose love for us is without measure and without end. And may our love for you also be without end. May we be as courageous in love as you were, doing the work of compassion and justice to which you call us. So hear us now as we pray with faith and hope for those places in the shadows, those dark corners that need your light. We pray for those who are suffering this morning in places of war. We think of the people of Ukraine, of Gaza, Israel. We pray for children, the children whom Christ loved, we pray for the outcasts, the ones whom Christ cherished. We pray for those who are sick, the ones whom Christ healed. And we pray for the grieving, asking your most tender touch. All these prayers we offer in the name of the one who walked that hard and holy road to the cross so that we might always know him as living one, as Messiah, friend, and we pray the prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God is able to provide us with every blessing in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, we may share abundantly in every good work. Our morning offering will be received.
Long ago, loving Lord, the crowds offered you their coats to walk. To walk on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm we'll good, all right? join in. <laughs> oh, no, we all do it together. Long ago, <laughs> loving, loving Lord, Lord, the crowds offered, offered you their coats, coats to walk on. on. They you waved wave palm branches, branches to honor your presence. Today, we honor you with our offerings. We lay these gifts before you, tokens of our love for our King of Kings. Amen. You may be seated. Our reading today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 12. Listen now for the word of God. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. So let me take you back five years. On Palm Sunday, 2019, I stepped into this pulpit to deliver my sermon, and I couldn't wait to preach it because I had the best opening illustration for my Palm Sunday sermon, one that involves standing here in the pulpit and gloating. Yes, gloating. For context, I grew up, as many of you know, in Charlottesville, Virginia, about a mile from the University of Virginia, where my daddy taught math and my granddaddy taught math, and all of us in my family right to this present day are diehard UVA basketball fans as are, of course, most all of the residents of Charlottesville, VA. And in 2019, Palm Sunday happened to fall just six days after UVA had won the NCAA men's basketball tournament, their first championship ever. Now that was March Madness. My sermon title that morning, We've Waited So Long. I drew a direct comparison between the people of Jerusalem waiting centuries for a messiah and Virginia fans like me waiting a lifetime for a national championship. As an analogy, it was a stretch, but it did allow me to stand here in triumphant joy and yes, gloat, even knowing that I was looking out at fans of all the other teams that Virginia had beaten, I stood here reveling in that moment. That was five years ago. Palm Sunday 2024 comes, unfortunately, after a different sort of week for Virginia fans. On Tuesday night, the boys in blue and orange had, shall we say, a challenging evening. It was not the first round of the tournament. This was the round to get into the first round of the tournament. <laughs> and it did not go well. In fact, not well is a considerable Understatement, Virginia scored 14 points in the entire first half. Yeah, and no points at all in the last nine minutes of the game. They lost by 25 points, which was actually closer than it had looked like it was going to be. The ESPN commentators were having a field day coming up with every possible synonym for the word disaster that they could think of. So I turned off the sound and just said little prayers for each of those young men who would have to wake up the next morning and listen to all the scathing commentary and somehow go back to class with their chins up and just be 20-year-old students again. Ugh, I know, it's just a game, but still. So as crazy as it was for me to stand here five years ago and use my team for a Palm Sunday illustration, here I am doing it again. Because just maybe, this is a better Palm Sunday analogy, this rather disastrous and disappointing week for my hometown. Here's why. 
The week that is about to unfold, this week between now and Easter, this holy week, is a week that begins on an extraordinary high, yes, a champion's welcome, an exuberant crowd. But things get dicey pretty quickly, and the Monday to Friday of this week is a whole lot different than the Sunday that begins it, or the Sunday that ends it. There's disappointment, there's confusion, there's anger and, and great hurt, and through it all, a savior who walks steadfastly on. Let me take you back, not five years, but a, a couple thousand years to remember that week. It started with this amazing day, this Palm Sunday, which really was the welcome of champions there was a buzz all over Jerusalem that day. People in the streets were talking about who was headed their way. The word had come in from the countryside that that guy, that one that everyone had been hearing about, that Jesus of Nazareth was on his way. And what everyone was saying was that he was the one, the bringer of salvation, the one, the Christ. The one they'd been waiting for was about to ride through the gates of Jerusalem. The one who would make everything better. And here's the thing. They really needed things to be better in Jerusalem. They were on year 70 of Roman rule. 70 years of being oppressed by Caesar and his cohorts. They'd been down so long it looked like up to them. And this man... This Jesus, word on the street was that he was going to turn things around with his words and his miracles and his powers, with his personality and his following, with, if necessary, some force, some show of might, he was going to turn it around because this, this was the Messiah. That's what they'd heard. So no wonder the people of Jerusalem were were going crazy. No wonder they were lining the streets and tearing branches from the trees and screaming in joy. And that's how Jesus entered the final week of his life, this week that we now call Holy Week. That's how he entered in, as a man with a huge fan base, followed by crowds everywhere, adored, sought after. And then, then... Ever so slowly at first, the fans began to lose their enthusiasm. It started with, to be honest, it started with the donkey. The donkey he rode in on. It really wasn't the entrance into the city that they'd hoped for. They kind of thought a conquering hero would enter the capital city a little more dramatically, a little more regally. So, yeah, that was disappointing, a, a little odd. And then it was the people he was surrounding himself with. Yes, they had heard these stories, these sweet stories of how he healed lepers. That was wonderful, but they hadn't actually grasped that he would spend time with them, go to their homes. Tuesday night of Holy Week, Jesus had dinner with Simon the leper in the house of Simon the leper. And, and that, ugh, come on, that was... That was just wrong. That was kind of gross. And women? He had women followers, it turned out. He was actually seen talking to them in public, and that was a little inappropriate, they thought. And then, my God, tax collectors. I mean, they worked for the Romans. What kind of conquering hero goes and hangs out with the enemy? And so the fans, they began to ebb away. Jesus wasn't what they had in mind, after all. He was supposed to smite the bad guys, not sit down and talk to them again and again. He was supposed to marshal the troops, and instead he seemed more interested in talking to kids, an old widow woman in the temple, diseased folks. He was supposed to talk about power, but all he talked about was love. So they drifted away. A lot of them. They went searching for another Messiah to rally behind. This clearly wasn't the right one. They were disappointed, a lot of them, let down. This guy seemed, well, like a loser, hardly a championship player. And by the end of this week, 
Enough of them had soured on him that the crowd cheering for him on Palm Sunday had turned into a crowd standing silent as he walked the way of the cross. This week ahead of us, this, this holy week, is the most important week of our faith for all of us who are trying our best to follow Christ. Because in this week we remember who it is we follow, who it truly is. In between the palms of today and the lilies of next Sunday is the story that shapes our identities as Christians, a story that tells us who this Jesus really is. Not the big time king that people thought they were welcoming on Palm Sunday, but the servant of all, willing to follow the path of love wherever it led. Not a conquering hero with a sword in his hand, but a gentleman, uninterested in any glory this world had to offer. A man more interested in breaking bread with a tax collector. This week, this Holy Week shows us a man who knew, yes, the thrill of adulation, but willingly chose to walk a different path. This Holy Week shows us a Savior who could have chosen to stay on the winning team, but instead chose to look for those who most needed him, to defy expectations and instead choose love without measure. He knew what it would cost him but it was his choice to enter into the heart of human need, to walk with those who suffered, and to suffer himself. And he did that out of love. Jesus chose this hard path so that we would know that there is no journey we take that he does not walk with us, so that we would know that there is no limit to the places he will walk with us that there is no place so dark that he will not light our way through it, that there is no time so hard that he will not be there with us. Last week, I invited the men of Pivot Ministries to come and, and to speak to our teenagers at youth group. These are men, as, as you may well know, who are working hard to leave lives of addiction some of them are only a couple months into their new life and, and deep in the struggle still. And one of the men who spoke to our kids told them this story. He told them of growing up without love, without any sense of being wanted in this world, of his utter sense of aloneness. I lived a terrible life, he told my kids. And because of that, I was imprisoned for 11 years. And then he told them about being handed a Bible in prison and reading it all the way through and then again all the way through. And then I understood, he said to our kids, then I understood that I do matter, that there wasn't anything that I'd gone through alone because Jesus had gone through it with me. I just didn't know. That even when you're at your lowest point, and you don't feel like anything. God is with you in that place. Jesus is with you in that place. That's why it matters this week ahead of us. That's why it matters that the one we follow knew what it means to be at the top and cheered by the crowds and knows also what it means to lose that. Because by this we know that there is no place he has not gone and no limit to his love for us. Jesus of Nazareth, that carpenter from Galilee, was not the Messiah who was expected. This quiet, gentle man riding on a donkey was not the triumphant hero that people had in mind. But he was exactly the savior that the world needed. He is exactly the savior that we need. The one who walks with us on the mountaintops and down in the valleys too. The one who this week will love us to death and beyond. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed 
is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. For our final hymn, I've, I've chosen a hymn that I hope captures a sense of what I've just said, the depth of that love. What wondrous love is this? Our choir sang it so beautifully for us last Sunday, and today we join our voices in song. Let's stand and sing number 200. benediction is printed in your bulletin, a litany that we'll share in together, and Tony will lead us on page three. In the next seven days, our gentle Savior will walk a hard and lonely path. In our, in prayers, our prayers, in our, our hearts, hearts, help, help us, us to walk, walk with him. On Monday, he will drive the money changers from the temple. May we, we walk, walk with, with him in faithfulness, faithfulness to what is right and, and just. just. On Tuesday, he will teach parables of God's love to all who will listen. May we walk with him, teaching God's love in our words and our deeds. On Wednesday, he will welcome the outcast and heal the hurting. May we walk with him, excluding no one, embracing all. On Thursday, he will kneel and wash feet in humble service. May we walk with him, no act of kindness too humble, serving him as we serve others. 
On Friday, he will walk with courage along the way of the cross. May we walk with him bravely, wherever it is that God leads us. On Saturday, he will enter the darkness of death, so that we will fear it no more. May we walk with him, no longer fearing, trusting in a love that no darkness can quench. Lord Jesus Christ, in this sacred and solemn week, help us to walk with you wherever you go, to stop where you stumble, to listen when you cry, to hurt as you suffer, to bow our heads in sorrow as you die, so that when you are raised to life again, we may share in your endless joy. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.